Hello everyone, this is Cam from SoCalSLC.com coming at you with another video about my Superlight Coupe. Believe it or not, this car is so quirky that I couldn't fit all the quirks and features into one video, so I'm making a second one. I'll take you through the rest of the car, do a little bit of driving, and yes, I'm going to give it a cam score. Starting at the front, there are these massive cutouts for the front tires. This is for aerodynamics. It relieves the pressure from behind the wheel and allows it to flow out gives the car more downforce. Unfortunately what it means is you get a bunch of rocks and debris kicked up in this area and this is the hardest part of the car to keep clean. So apparently a few people didn't see the humor that I was trying to inject in my last video and I got a couple of comments about you know carbon fiber this, carbon fiber that, carbon fiber, carbon fiber, enough! Alright so I guess I'll just... Carbon fiber center cap. As many viewers have pointed out, these door handles come straight off a Miata. As do these. Now a few people caught this in my earlier video, but no one's been able to figure out exactly what it is. Well it's actually a tether for a child seat, so if I want to install a car seat in my SLC and take my daughter around with me, I can do that. I've had a few upgrades since my last video. I installed these nets behind the seats here for a little more storage. Take that McLaren Santa. Now before I get started with the driving portion of this video, there are a couple more quirks and features of this car that I'd like to cover before we get on the road, just in case the mic gets a little drowned out. First off are these harnesses. It's a six point safety belt, and it feels like you're strapping yourself into a jet fighter when you put these on. Nice and tight. And it pops off with a flick of the finger. One of the first things you notice when you sit down in the car is that the seats are actually quite comfortable. That's unusual for carbon fiber seats, but these just kind of cup you just right. The next weird thing you'll notice right away when you sit in the car is that the steering wheel feels a little bit low. In most cars that I drive, I have the steering wheel pointed closer towards my face, but in this case, the steering wheel is pointed closer to my chest. And this is actually as high as I can get the steering wheel to go before it hits my dash. At first I thought this would be really odd, but once you get used to it, it feels second nature. In most cars, the steering wheel actually isn't pointed straight at you. For instance, in my normal car, the steering wheel is more like this. However, in this case, the steering wheel is pointed straight at you. And I did that on purpose. The way the steering column is designed in this car, it's actually at an angle. It's kind of like this. And you can see looking at the center binnacle that the center line of the vehicle is more like this. It's a bit difficult to see, so I'll throw up a picture showing what it looked like during build. So with my seat aligned with the steering wheel, it actually means that my legs are pointing off at an angle. At first I thought this would be weird, but it becomes second nature very quickly. You don't even notice it. I'll talk about the A-pillar before we get on the road. You can see it's actually rather large. But the funny thing is, forward visibility is actually quite good. You learn to look past the A-pillar. Finally, driving the super light coupe. My in-car GoPro died on me while I was driving, so you guys are just going to have to deal with me dubbing my voice over this recording. I have to admit, I've had the car for several months now, and driven it for about 1,200 miles, and I still feel like it's an occasion when I drive the car. The night before, I have a hard time falling asleep, and I tend to wake up early. Once I get into the car, my heart's pumping and the adrenaline's going. It takes a few miles for the nervousness to go away. It does take some time getting used to being in the car. You feel like some kind of local celebrity. People are always driving by and taking photos or videoing the car, and people walk up to you when you're stopped. Now you might notice I'm getting passed by cars during this video. I'm driving slow on purpose. This car sticks out like a sore thumb, and I'm not exactly fond of getting tickets. I have Waze on right now, and it looks like law enforcement is pretty heavy right now. Shout out to the Waze team for an awesome map. The car is fast, 550 horsepower, 480 foot-pounds of torque, and about 3,000 pounds. Now I say 3,000 pounds, I haven't actually weighed the car yet. I think it's one of the heavier SLCs built. I purposely put a lot of noise and heat control materials in the car, almost 200 pounds. I'm also running air conditioning, a heater, and a radio. It may even come in over 3,000 pounds. Even so, traction management is difficult in the first two gears. People have asked me what the 0-60 time is. My answer is, it's difficult. 
I don't really have the driver's skills to keep the tires from spinning in the first two gears with anything more than 50% throttle. On the highway, passing is effortless. Even in sixth gear, the torque band is so flat that you really don't need downshift to pass traffic. Of course, there are faster cars out there. Freeway interchanges and on ramps are fun. Here we go. I've talked about the go, now I gotta talk about the slow. This car's got manual brakes and it has no ABS. Coming from a guy who's basically growing up only driving cars with ABS, this has been a new experience for me. I don't have thighs like the Incredible Hulk, so brake modulation can be a little bit difficult at times. I just don't have confidence like I do in driving a car with ABS. I'm sure I can lock the brakes up, but that's not exactly what you want. Changing lanes is like a hot knife through butter. It just slices through everything. Oh look, a tunnel. Thank you, minivan. Thank you so much. Let's try that again. God, I don't know if it's coming through in the audio, but the exhaust just sounds so damn good. It really is intoxicating. It just sounds so angry. Mm -hmm. Car on the side of the road, that doesn't help. So that's my relatively straightforward breakdown of what it's like to drive a super light coupe. I know, I know. You want me to be more excited. Yes, it's a crazy car to drive. Yes, it's absolutely thrilling. And yes, my adrenaline is always pumping when I get into that car. It's just really hard to describe how incredible it is to drive a super light coupe. One of those things you just have to experience to really understand. Here's one last pull for you. We'll go from 60 miles per hour to Something a little bit more. And so that's my Superlight SLC. I built it. It's got a bunch of weird quirks, but it's mine, and I'm happy with how it all turned out. If you're looking for a project you're going to be excited to work on, dread seeing, love wrenching, hate troubleshooting, sometimes all at the same time, this is that car. And now, it's time to give it a cam score. Starting with the weekend categories, in styling the SLC's looks aren't for everyone, but I just can't stop looking at it. Its looks are slightly dated and are reminiscent of the late 80s, early 90s Group C race cars. It gets an 8 out of 10. Acceleration, it accelerates and pulls harder than any car I've ever driven, but there are many other cars out there much faster than this. There's no traction control, and it's traction limited in the first three gears. Getting super low 0-60 to 60 times requires a very skilled driver. It gets a 7 out of 10. Handling is sharp. The CG of this car is just exceptionally low. It's light and has a ton of downforce from this massive rear wing. Add it all up and it's a formidable weapon on the street, and rivals just about any exotic production car available today. It gets a 9 out of 10. Fun factor is high. Step on the gas and the acceleration and noise bombarding your senses is enough to give you a natural high. It scores a 10 out of 10. Cool factor is strong. Everywhere you go, people are pulling out their cameras and snapping photos or rolling video. It attracts a ton of attention and makes you feel like a celebrity. The likelihood of seeing another SLC on the street is virtually zero. It gets a 10 out of 10. For a total weekend score of 44 out of 50. An exceptionally high score and probably biased. Things take a pretty drastic turn in the daily categories. In features, it's decently well equipped for an SLC, but pales in comparison to even bargain basement economy cars. It gets a 3 out of 10. Comfort is surprisingly good for what it is. Your back isn't sore after a drive in the canyons, and you have the ability to soften the suspension. Every surface you see and touch is hard except the quarter-inch padding on the seats. Their steering wheel is leather, but that's where the refinement ends. In-cabin sound can be obnoxious despite all my efforts, especially for long highway drives. It gets a 4 out of 10. Quality? Well, I built this car. It gets a 1 out of 10. Practicality is terrible. 
It's got no storage, probably not watertight, and the windows don't roll down. It gets a 1 out of 10. Value. It's not a cheap car, and I spent 2400 hours building it. Multiply that number by my standard hourly rate, and that number is pretty ugly. It gets a 1 out of 10. For a total daily score of 10 out of 50. In truth, I may have scored this car a little harder in the daily compared to other performance or exotic cars, but I'm just trying to be blunt. It's not a car you can easily daily. If you build or buy one of these, it's not likely you're going to drive it every day. But when you do, it'll be an amazing experience. Add it up and the cam score is... 54 out of 100. While 54 isn't stellar, there's no denying that this is an exceptionally unique vehicle, and the experience of building and driving it far outweighs any kind of cam score I could have given it. Knowing what I know now, would I do it again? Absolutely.